Okay. So today we are going to talk all things ulcerative colitis. We're going to review testing, nutrition, and management. First, just copyright, and then a disclaimer, just reminding you that anything recommended in this presentation is intended just for educational purposes. It's not to be taken as specific medical advice for any individual patient. Okay, so let's just start with kind of the basics. What is ulcerative colitis? It is one of the forms of inflammatory bowel disease, and you are probably familiar with the other form, uh, which is Crohn's. Uh, but this particular type of IBD causes ulcerations and inflammation primarily in the large intestines. And I will, I will go over in a little bit more detail different types of ulcerative colitis in, in just a moment. But it's just like the name sounds, ulcerations and then itis is obviously inflammation. So it makes sense. So the inflammation in ulcerative colitis differs from that of Crohn's in two main ways. So first, the inflammation is pretty restricted to the superficial layers of the colon, so the mucosa and the submucosa. And then second, the disease is really more contained to the colon and kind of isolated to the colon. So the inflammation might start in the rectum, and then it often just continually ascends into the large intestines. So a couple of other things that we often end up with and seeing with ulcerative colitis is these ulcerations or erosions, and then we also often see bleeding. And we'll talk about um, some signs and symptoms in just a minute, but this is the more common type of IBD that's more common and prevalent than Crohn's. And just in terms of giving you an idea of how many people are affected by this, it's estimated that up to 900,000 people in the U.S. are affected, and it accounts for about a quarter million office visits annually. So it's something that you probably will, see, will be seeing. So I mentioned just a minute ago, there are some subtypes of ulcerative colitis, and they are, they're really classified by the location and where what is affected in the colon. So you might see this sort of categorized after the client has maybe undergone a colonoscopy. You might see it in the report. And so I've broken down the subtypes here. That's what you're seeing on the screen. And so first, proctitis is where it is just confined to the rectum. The inflammation is confined to the rectum. Proctosigmoiditis, it's the rectum and then that lower end of the colon, which is the sigmoid colon, that's the area that's really inflamed. Left-sided colitis, the inflammation extends from the rectum to the descending colon, and then pancolitis is just involving the entire colon. So that's, you may see these subtypes referenced at some point. Now, another important fact about UC, I'll just call it most of the time instead of saying ulcerative colitis every time, but another important fact is that it is more common in certain or specific populations. So a few things to consider when you are maybe seeing a client that you suspect you see in. So a family history is the most important independent risk factor of having this, okay? So having a first degree relative with UC increases the risk by four times. So they're four times more likely if they have a first degree relative. And then it's most commonly diagnosed and seen in patients either earlier in life, so 15 to 30 years of age, or a little bit later in that 50 to 70 age range. And then demographics is also a factor. So certain races and certain ethnicities, we see it more commonly in. It's more common in Caucasians, and it is also more common in Ashkenazi uh, Jewish descent. Ulcerative colitis generally begins gradually, and it worsens over time, without, especially without treatment. But Having said that, the onset can sometimes be sudden. So symptoms can certainly come on suddenly. And they do range in severity. And of course, this also depends on if the person might be in a, having a flare-up or whether or not they're in remission. So when they're in remission and free of symptoms, that can last for weeks to years. But the, the treatment is really focused on maintaining remission as long as possible, of course. And so I've listed some of the symptoms here that you might see in these patients. But the most common symptom is this bloody diarrhea, also known as hematochesia. You may, that's just the medical term. You may hear it called that. 
often there's also mucus in the stool. There actually may be pus in the stool. But some of the other symptoms that generally go along with that, they may have some rectal bleeding, abdominal pain and cramping, just pain in the rectum. And they might also report this sensation of kind of the constant urge to have a bowel movement despite having like multiple episodes of diarrhea. So basically the the bowels are, are really empty, but they have this urge that they still need to go. That's that's called tenesmus. So you may hear that term as well. And they they often also have weight loss. So you may see that they've lost some weight. If it's at a younger age, failure to grow, fatigue, fever, all of those can be symptoms. Now, another kind of important um, fact is that anywhere between 10 to up to 30% of patients will also experience extra GI or extra gut manifestations. Um, and, and really, it's all related to inflammation. So you may see or they may report things like joint pain and arthritis. It may be um, something related to their eyes. There may be some um, irritation in their eyes, some swelling, inflammation. And then they may also report some skin issues, um, skin rashes and lesions. Now, ulcerative colitis is not benign, and it does increase your risk for other health conditions. So first, things like anemia and blood clots, they're at greater risk, colorectal cancer, primary sclerosing cholangitis, which is just a type of chronic liver disease, and then osteoporosis. They're also at higher risk for that, generally due to nutrient malabsorption. And we'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later. Okay, so I've already told you that there are certain populations that are at increased risk. So we have, we covered that, we've covered signs and, signs and symptoms. But what about specific causes? What actually causes um, ulcerative colitis? Often the exact cause is unknown, but there are certain things that are believed to play a role or a factor. And often it's thought that it's a combination of these things that we're going to talk about now. Genetics, the environment, the immune system. And so I'm going to review those and give you a little bit of information on those. So genetics, we already mentioned that. There is that genetic predisposition especially if there is a a first degree relative. Remember, you're four times more likely to develop ulcerative colitis. And there is, there are actually over a hundred genes that have been associated with inflammatory bowel disease. And 23 of those are specifically associated with ulcerative colitis. So certainly a genetic component there. There can also be some immune system dysfunction. So what can happen is we can get this exaggerated immune response that targets the tissue in the large intestine, and that can play a role or is thought to play a role in the development of ulcerative colitis. And they've also found in research that there are antibodies against colonic epithelial cells in many of these patients. So there may be some antibody production and just this, again, exaggerated immune response. Dysbiosis. So simply having an unbalanced gut microbiota, basically, can lead to, we know that that can lead to immune dysregulation, which then causes issues with the intestinal barrier, right? We can get increased intestinal permeability. Also, again, just an inflammatory response. And then a few other things that that we know and that we see repeated in the literature is that People with ulcerative colitis and dysbiosis, we generally see reduced levels of the Firmicutes phyla. And you would see this, we're going to talk about on comprehensive stool testing. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit. But you may see that the Firmicutes phyla is low. You may see that the Bacteroidetes phyla is overgrown. And then there also is often an overgrowth of a couple of anaerobic bacteria, specifically Enterococcus and Enterobacter. So those are some of the things that you might pick up on if you order um, a comprehensive stool test. And then the environment, just like our Western diet and lifestyle seem to increase the risk for UC. Um, and, And not just ulcerative colitis, but also so other forms of IBD. 
So we think not only diet, we also think in that sort of lifestyle that we often live. We think about medications like using NSAIDs, oral contraceptives, repeated antibiotic use, and then environmental like air and water pollution. Stress is a huge factor also, and I'll go into a little more detail on that in a bit. But just to recap, in looking at what causes ulcerative colitis, it's typically a combination of things that's related to genetics, immune system function, the state of the microbiome, and then our diet and lifestyle, again, certainly play a role there. So when you are seeing a client that maybe has not been diagnosed yet, and you are thinking, wow, this kind of maybe fits some type of IBD picture, maybe ulcerative colitis, we want to also be thinking about what are some of the other differential diagnoses to consider. And so these are kind of differentials, especially for having that bloody diarrhea, which is their generally their number one chief complaint. And so some of the some of the things that you also want to consider are maybe it's Crohn's, maybe it's another form of IBD. Colorectal cancer certainly needs to be ruled out. Maybe it's infectious colitis, meaning that they have some type of either parasite, bacteria, or virus, some type of pathogen that has caused a lot of inflammation and irritation. And then there are, are some other causes and things that we need to consider. So there are other reasons, things like maybe they've had some type of radiation, and maybe they've taken tons of NSAIDs, maybe it's ischemic colitis, things like that are other possible causes and differential diagnoses to consider. Okay, now I'm going to break down sort of conventional diagnostics and I'll, I'll talk about conventional treatment. And then we'll also talk about functional diagnostics and functional uh, treatment. So conventionally, you're probably going to see things like blood labs being drawn. Obviously, this could be functional as well, but a CBC, a CMP, and then some inflammatory markers like a C-reactive protein or an ESR. Those are routinely ordered for people who are coming in with this bloody diarrhea, abdominal pain. And then on that, on those labs, on that workup, you might see anemia. So you might see things like a low albumin. You might see elevated CRP and ESR levels. And then stool testing. Most of the time in conventional medicine, we're generally not ordering comprehensive stool testing, but there may be some stool testing done. That's really more to look for pathogens and, and rule out that infectious colitis that I said could be one of the potential differentials that we need to think about, especially if where this would probably come into play more in, in the conventional system is maybe someone has been taking antibiotics and they have this massive diarrhea and you're thinking maybe they have C. diff. So that's generally where that is ordered um, more often in a conventional setting. Also, looking at fecal calprotectin and uh, lactoferrin levels, um, these are proven to be sensitive biomarkers for IBD, for all forms of inflammatory bowel disease. And they're, they're generally elevated in active disease because, of course, there's more inflammation, there's more white blood cells, activity within the intestines. And so these tend to be elevated in more when it isn't when it's active and not in remission. And then, of course, your colonoscopy with a biopsy is the best way to confirm. And it'll help, too, to distinguish between is it potentially Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. Generally, most of these patients are going to have undergone a colonoscopy or you're going to be referring them uh, for that if they have not. Okay, now in terms of in the functional space, what are some of the testing that we might look at? I already mentioned comprehensive stool testing. Um, examples of that would be the GI MAP test by Diagnostic Solutions, GI Effects by Genova. Those are two of probably the more popular comprehensive stool tests. Those can both be ordered on your RUPA platform, but really both great tests and giving you lots of biomarkers. You're going to be able to look at not only some of those inflammatory markers like calprotectin, but you can look also to see, are there specific pathogens that are causing inflammation or a, a colitis type picture? Is there dysbiosis? 
We can also look at what's the digestive capacity. How well are they digesting? And then also, what is their immune response? How is their immune system responding um, to what's going on? And then there's this, these antibodies called perinuclear antineutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies, or P-A-N-C-A. So regardless of the disease stage or progression, this antibody is present in 60 to 70% of your ulcerative colitis patients. Very common to see this. So this may be something um, that you want to consider ordering. There is also another antibody that's called um, an anti-saccharomyces cervase antibody. It's abbreviated as ASCA. Now that one is present in both Crohn's and in ulcerative colitis, but is more prominent in Crohn's. So this one that I have listed on the screen is specific to UC, but then the other one can be seen in both UC and in Crohn's. And then oh, breath testing. So that might be something that you want to consider as well if you suspect SIBO. If somebody's having maybe extreme bloating and gas, there is an, a noted increased prevalence of SIBO in patients just with IBD in general, with either form of inflammatory bowel disease. And it's actually estimated that the frequency of SIBO in patients with UC is up to about 18%. It's, it's not uncommon to see that. So some examples of this in terms of ordering, you could order a three-hour SIBO breath test. That's by Genova. Again, this is all on your Rupa platform. You can order there. Or there's one also called Trio Smart by Gamelli. That's another um, good one that you might want to consider. And then this is obvious, but our main goals here are to put the client into remission and then to keep them in remission, right? So I didn't include a slide for this, but I want to mention what are what are some of the causes of a flare-up? So let's say somebody we know has been diagnosed, they have, and then they've been doing well for a couple of years. What could be some of the causes of flare-ups? It could, sometimes we don't know uh, what causes a flare-up, but just some things to consider and when you're, when you're talking with your clients, these are things that you're going to want to be asking. So maybe you can identify uh, what the culprit is or was. It could be dietary changes. It could be stress. Stress is, plays a really big factor here. It could be medications like NSAIDs or antibiotics. It could be that they've developed some type of infection. Like I said, some type they've picked up some type of bacteria or parasite, something like that. It could be hormonal changes. It could be sleep disturbances. It could be environmental factors. But again, all of those things can cause someone who's been in remission to have an acute flare-up, but sometimes we don't know. Those are just things that you want to consider and ask and question the client around to see if you can get at what did cause that flare-up. So now let's talk about treatment. And again, I've broken this down into conventionally what you might see, and then we'll talk about functionally what we can do as well. So conventional treatment for ulcerative colitis is based on the extent of the disease and the severity. The literature shows that the prognosis in the first decade after they're diagnosed, so the first 10 years after they're diagnosed is generally good. Patients generally go into remission and generally do well. But some of the things that we that we may see used or want to utilize are anti-inflammatories, of course, because remember that's the main issue here is not only is there inflammation, yes, there are also ulcerations there, but the, the biggest issue is just massive inflammation. So you may see steroids being used, um, immune system, you know, suppressive medications, things that suppress the immune system. So that might be immune modulators. It might be biologics, things like Humira or Remicade. Those are common ones that we hear about and see being used. But the, the idea is that we are just trying to turn off or lower the inflammation and get them into remission. Sometimes surgery ends up needing needing to happen. So it could be that they need part of their colon removed if they failed medical therapy. But also another thing to consider that I wanted to bring up here, especially for people who are on chronic or longer term steroid use, um, 
you'll want to make sure that they are also being supplemented with calcium and with vitamin D to prevent bone loss and osteoporosis. And then also, based on how much bleeding they've had, they might be anemic. They may need iron supplementation. So those are just other things that you'll want to consider. Okay, this is kind of a little bit of a busy slide, but I'm just going to summarize it uh, for us. But so talking about nutrition for ulcerative colitis, there's not a specific diet that's recommended to treat UC or to treat flares or to maintain remission. There's not just one uh, specific diet. However, what we do know is that a diet that is high in omega-6 fatty acids, so bad fats, saturated fats, a lot of animal protein, um, a lot of food additives, all of that increases the risk for IBD and also, of course, increases inflammation. So that's the type of diet that we want to um, steer away from. And on the flip side, we know that a diet that is high in whole foods, fruits, vegetables, um, omega-3 fatty acids, you know, healthier fats, uh, we know that that has the opposite effect. So the other thing that also to consider in these patients is adding soluble fiber really helps encourage butyrate production by those beneficial or good bacteria. And butyrate is a short chain fatty acid that has anti-inflammatory effects. So really beneficial. Sometimes we'll even supplement with butyrate, um, especially if we have uh, a comprehensive stool test and we see that some of those beneficial bacteria the short chain fatty acid producers are very low or sometimes not even detected at all, then we'll supplement with some butyrate. And I'm going to review a case um, in a few minutes uh, and talk a little bit more about that. But another, other two other diets that, that you might see or you might want to recommend to your clients, one of them is called the specific carbohydrate diet, the SCD. And this this is originally designed for celiac patients, but it emphasizes eliminating grains, sugars, processed foods. And what we've seen in the research is that there is some efficacy with this SCD diet in inducing remission in your IBD patients as soon as two months and maintaining remission for up to two years. So this could be an option uh, that you might want to talk to your clients about. And then there's also, of course, the low FODMAP diet. Now, this excludes certain carbohydrates. It's a little less rest restrictive than the SCD diet, and it has been shown to really more help with symptoms, more of your IBS-type symptoms that these inflammatory bowel disease patients may experience. So those are options. Again, not a specific diet for ulcerative colitis, but just some options that you might want to consider. Now, Another thing to consider here and to educate on is that there may be some trigger foods that we want them to avoid. Some things that we know that can trigger a flare in terms of food, one is insoluble fiber. So insoluble fiber is harder to digest. So we're thinking about things like fruits with skin on them, seeds, Raw vegetables are often really hard to digest. Things like cruciferous vegetables, especially broccoli, cauliflower, also nuts. I think I mentioned seeds, but nuts also, whole grains. All of that insoluble fiber can be hard for these people to digest and can trigger a flare. So just something to consider. We want them to have more soluble forms of fiber. And then lactose. So lactose is the sugar found in things like dairy, milk, cheese, things like that. Um, and then also non-absorbable sugars, things like sorbitol, mannitol, other kind of sugar alcohols. You typically are seeing those in like sugar-free gums and candy and maybe ice cream, things like that. Though That can, can trigger a flare. For some people, alcohol can or caffeinated drinks. So it doesn't matter whether it's beer, wine, liquor, and then soda with caffeine or coffee, tea, anything like that. I've already mentioned high fat foods, so things like fried foods, really greasy foods, margarine, cream, things like that. And then foods that are higher in sulfur. So that would be things like garlic, onions, cruciferous vegetables, seafood, eggs, legumes, nuts and seeds, things like that. So 
you may want to educate them on reducing the amount or avoiding these things altogether. And certainly ask and get more information if they did have a flare. Maybe it was around ingesting some of these foods that maybe they don't normally eat. And then they started eating or ate on like a special occasion, ate or drank on a special occasion. So some supplements and herbs that you may want to use. So we, we want to be using things, again, the biggest issue here is inflammation and lowering inflammation. Not only that, but healing these ulcerated areas that, that they tend to have in the large intestine. So a few things, boswellia, also known as frankincense, is great. Turmeric, of course, is great. This is, these are good for not only acute flares, but these are also good for, again, maintaining, hopefully maintaining uh, remission. There are other anti-inflammatory supplements, things like uh, resveratrol. There's also been some trials showing that, some smaller trials showing that uh, berberine is also promising in these patients. But really anything natural that's anti-inflammatory. The other thing that you might want to consider, because they often do have a lot of abdominal discomfort, cramping, pain, they may be having gas pains, things like that, is you want to give something like a carminative herb or an, sort of like an antispasmodic herb. So that would be things like peppermint, ginger, chamomile. Those are some of the botanicals that are good and can pro that are um, generally not harmful that can uh, provide some symptom relief, especially. Then next up, aloe vera. So aloe vera is an example of a demulch, and that really helps not only with inflammation, but it's soothing to that gut lining and can help with those areas of ulceration. Some other demulcents. Now, aloe vera, there, there was a study. I'll mention this first. There was a study. Um, that looked at aloe vera in this population supplementing for four weeks and found that that was superior to placebo at inducing remission in patients with mild to moderate UC. So that's, that's pretty big, right? So we're wanting to use those demulcent type herbs to soothe the gut lining and to heal these ulcerated areas. But some other demulcents, and you're, you're often going to find these in combination forms, so some other demulcents that you might see, generally you see these in powders, are things like slippery elm, marshmallow root, DGL, and aloe. You'll find those often in a lot of combination products. So something like that would be good and supportive for these patients. Now, I already mentioned butyrate. So butyrate is a short-chain fatty acid. You could, many of the products that you see on the market are just butyrate. But you can find some that are a combination of other short-chain fatty acids like acetate, propionate, and butyrate. You can also do uh, these in enema form, and that has been shown to be beneficial, especially in people with distal and left-sided ulcerative colitis. That's been shown to be beneficial. And then probiotics. So probiotics are, are helpful in not only managing this acute flare, but also in maintaining remission. So obviously probiotics help to maintain that sort of homeostasis and that good balance in the microbiome, but they also help to reduce intestinal, increased intestinal permeability or leaky gut. And they also help with modulating that immune response. So these are going to be your, probably your top tools to use um, naturally for these patients. A few other things to mention are some complementary and alternative practices. So there was actually a, a meta-analysis of, of different studies. This was back in this paper was put out in 2007, but actually concluded that acupuncture was superior to conventional medications with, of course, higher safety profiles in treating ulcerative colitis. So acupuncture, referring somebody for acupuncture can be really, really helpful um, in these people. Stress, I mentioned that a couple of times already, I think. Stress is huge. So stress management is a really, really important aspect of treatment for these people. We know a couple of things. Stress negatively impacts the gut, um, especially in IBD, by impairing that intestinal barrier function, by disturbing the gut microbiome and the balance, by dysregulating the immune system. All of these things that we know play a big factor. 
And so you can give your client some suggestions around stress management, whether it's something like therapy, counseling, maybe it's something like yoga. Another thing that we know from the literature is that depression and anxiety are common in this population as well. So mindfulness practices, breath work, doing some vagus nerve work, all of those things can be, can be really helpful. And then the third point here you see is decreasing the overall toxic burden that can really help to lower inflammation. So whether it's we want to think about just really everything, right? The environment, the air, the water, the food that we're consuming. And then also glyphosate has been linked to ulcerative colitis. So maybe even, you know, is suggesting that they try and eat more organic if they can, because we know that glyphosate has been linked to ulcerative colitis. And then fecal microbiota transplantation. So that's, I would say, more, it's not new by any means, but it's more kind of emerging um, in this field. And basically it's taking, you know, fecal material from a healthy donor and putting it into someone with ulcerative colitis to correct disruptions in that ecosystem. And there was a study on this and it, they looked at 85 patients with ulcerative colitis that had fecal microbiota transplantation. And they found that there was a fourfold increase in remission. So really was very helpful. So again, just some things to consider. And then I wanted to share a case with you. So this is a patient that I had several, several months ago, but I just pulled out the kind of most important parts of her history. So she's 35 year old female. She was diagnosed about nine years prior and she had been on and off immunosuppressive agents over the years. She would try one thing, do fine for a little while, then go have a flare, then go try something else. She's also a professional bodybuilder, which was really affect, I'll talk about this a little bit more when we look at her test, but was really, I think, affecting her in a lot of ways, not only with what she was limiting herself that she was eating. It's a very, very high protein diet, as you can imagine. But then also she was just putting a lot, lot of stress on her body, especially when she was, you know, getting ready to compete and things like that. She was having a lot of bloating. Abdominal pain was intermittent. And then, of course, she had that hematochesia, that bloody diarrhea with flare-ups. She typically, when she had a flare, would have five to six stools a day, which some people have a lot more than that. She was having some weight loss, some joint pain, so some of those extra GI manifestations. And then she also, in addition to what she was doing to her body, you know, with preparing for shows, she also had taken a new job and she was under an extreme amount of stress with that new job. So just a lot of things going on. So what I'm going to show you is I did a comprehensive stool test on her. I did a GI map on her and I'm going to show you sort of the, the most prominent things that stuck out on the test. I didn't show you the first page of the test. If you're familiar with the GI map, on the very first page of the test are all of these pathogens that are bad pathogens that we certainly don't want to have any of in the body. Things like C. diff and E. coli and some parasites like Giardia. All of those were negative. All of those were below detectable limit. So I didn't include that page in here because nothing showed up. No H. pylori. I didn't show you that either, but she did not have any H. pylori. So what we're going to look at first here are her commensal bacteria. So if you look... She really has more of, if we just look at these individual strains, she really has more of an insufficient pattern. So her bifidobacterium is low. Her enterobacter is low. She has no acromancia at all. The Galibacterium and Roseburia are good. So remember that acromancia, the Calibacterium, and Roseburia are all short-chain fatty acid producers. And Often, sometimes we see it like this, where there's no acromancia and the others are okay. Sometimes we see all of them are low. But especially with this acromancia being not detected at all, it's important to, for her to supplement excuse me, with some butyrate to help with that short-chain fatty acid production. Other things to consider with acromancia are they, the growth of acromancia responds pretty well to polyphenols. So giving, whether you give a polyphenol 
supplement or you want to include more polyphenols in the diet, either one of those. And then also these respond really well to fiber. So again, we want to do more of that soluble fiber because insoluble can be um, harder to digest, uh, especially for these people. Um, so fiber, polyphenols, supplementing with some butyrate. But then also just another thing to point out is when you look at the bacterial phyla, she has more of an overgrowth pattern. So Formicutes is definitely overgrown. And then uh, Bacteroidetes is borderline, but it's ticking up. This really lends you to think more of a maldigestive pattern. So often we see this when people have hypochlorhydria. And I'm going to point out a couple more things as we go on that really support that. But just know that when the phyla are overgrown like this, it, it often means that there's maldigestion, and often that is from hypochlorhydria. And there are many reasons that you could have hypochlorhydria or low stomach acid. One thing that we often see on these tests, which she actually did not have, is H. pylori, because H. pylori produces an enzyme called urease that neutralizes the stomach acid, but she did not have that. It was not detected on her test. But another thing that I think is very prominent for her that causes low stomach acid is stress. I already mentioned she was putting a lot of stress on her body with competing, being a professional bodybuilder, but then she was also under a lot of stress with her job. And so just I just want to make a couple of points here. Stress puts you in a sympathetic state, right? So when you're in a sympathetic state and you have less parasympathetic activity, which is your rest and digest, then you have less acid being produced. So she's got, le right off the bat, she's super stressed out. She's got less acid being produced. Also, we're going to see as we continue on to look at the test, she also has low digestive enzymes. And so when you don't have enough stomach acid, you also don't make enough digestive enzymes. So what happens is stomach acid triggers the release of digestive enzymes from the pancreas. So that can, that's also another sign of low stomach acid is not having enough digestive enzymes. And then the other thing that we, that we know happens as well is you don't, when you don't have enough stomach acid, you don't absorb nutrients as you should, right? So she's got a lot, she's got symptoms of bloating and gas. So food is probably sitting on her stomach a little bit longer. And she's not also, if she doesn't have enough acid and enzymes, she's not going to extract the nutrients from it. So Again, they can really start to develop a lot of nutrient uh, deficiencies. Okay, so let's move on to the next page, which actually is not bad at all. A lot of times we see a lot worse in this opportunistic section. So she's got a little bit of strep overgrowth. So something just to make note of is that it can be a normal finding to see some of these show up, like some level in this opportunistic um, section. Where we have a problem is when the opportunity, just like they, it sounds, when the opportunity is right for these to become overgrown. So strep, for instance, strep thrives in a lower acid environment. So strep is, it's not terrible. We're still at the same order of magnitude. So we're still at an E3, but it is high. So again, this is not terrible, but just something to think about and make note of as we work on a treatment plan. In terms of this last page, so we've got a lot going on here. So a few things just to point out. As I mentioned, her elastase 1, which is one of the digestive enzymes, it's really the only one that we can measure in the stool. We can measure the output in the stool. She's extremely low, right? Again, I think that this could be from low stomach acid. She's not making enough enzymes. She's under a lot of stress all very, very common, but we're definitely going to want to be supplementing here with some enzymes that not only should help with symptoms, but also help with nutrient absorption. Then you see her beta-glucuronidase is elevated. So remember that beta-glucuronidase is an enzyme that helps with a couple of things. It helps with the metabolism of complex carbohydrates, and it also is really important in detoxification. It's actually a key factor in regulating estrogen metabolism and detoxing out estrogen. Often when we see this elevated, we know that there is possibly some 
circulate some more circulating estrogen in the body. So that's something that we want to consider and maybe giving her uh, some liver support. And then there is also some blood showing up. Now she was right on the end of a flare. So she was in a flare. She was coming out of a flare. So not uncommon that we're going to see a decent amount of blood here. And then her secretory IgA. So looking at this immune response, she is extremely low. Not surprising, right? Her body is under a lot of stress. Other things that we see lower this level often, not only stress, are if there are pathogens, which really she had some strep overgrowth, but she didn't really fit the picture of having a lot of pathogens. And then also another thing that you see just of note with this sometimes is um, food sensitivities and having um, a lot of food sensitivities can weaken the immune system because our immune system is always trying to bring things into balance. And so when it's working over time, all of the time, then it can get depleted. And then the other thing that we see here is this inflammatory marker, this calprotectin, especially in a flare, you expect to see this elevated. So we, we do see that there. And then let's go on. So that's a summary of her test. And then let's go on to sort of the areas of focus and plan here. So some things that we want to consider and things that I included in her protocol were the areas of focus were inflammation. So using a combination of things like turmeric, boswellia, quercetin, resveratrol, and then gut lining support. So those demulcent herbs, the aloe, marshmallow root, slippery elm, DGL, those are all great repopulating with some probiotics and also helping with that dysbiotic picture that she has, although hers was not terrible, like I said, she did have some dysbiosis. And then supporting that immune system, because remember that secretory IgA was extremely low. Immunoglobulin, zinc carnosine, vitamin D, all of those are great for immune support. I also did use for liver support some milk thistle, so that's going to help that beta glucuronidase level and just help her liver to detox a little bit better. And then lastly, I mentioned some digestive support with not only with enzymes, but with HCL, with hydrochloric acid. And there are plenty of enzymes that you can get combination that have HCL in them already. So that's a, a summary of this case. And then lastly, before I think Lexi has an announcement, but before I turn that back over to her, we do, if you are interested in learning more about the GIMAP test, about how to interpret it, about protocols, we have another boot camp coming up. It starts July 22nd. Um, I'm going to get Lexi, if she will, to drop the link for that in the chat. If you're interested in registering, you do get a free GIMAP test that you can use on yourself. It's a six-week boot camp. We have uh, some of the DSL ed educators joining us, and this is going to be um, a new, we've actually revamped the whole boot camp. There'll be a lot more evidence based data um, in the boot camp, and there will be one live QA that is dedicated just to pediatric content. We've had a lot of requests over the last year and a half that we've been doing this boot camp to have some pediatric content. So, Dr. Amy Rolfson is going to be joining us for a live QA where you can bring all of your pediatric questions. I just wanted to mention that. And then also on my slides, I have lots of references. You'll be able to get all of those and go back if you want to explore any of this. Okay, awesome. Thank you guys for your attention. Lexi, I I'm going to start looking at the Q&A and let you move ahead with your announcement, and then we'll move back into a little bit of Q&A. Welcome to Rupa Health, the best place to order, manage, and track results from over 30 different lab companies in one single place for free. It's going to take you under two minutes to sign up, and you can order any functional medicine lab for your client in under 30 seconds. Let me show you how it's done. So here's our beautiful interface. I'm typing in the name of my client, selecting the lab that I want to order for them, and hitting send. From there, Rupa and their amazing team handle the rest. They email the client, collect payment, and even offer an interest-free three-month payment plan. We've also built the world's largest library of information about chronic health conditions, the lab tests that can help you find the root cause, and the evidence-based interventions that you can use to help people heal from them. It's called the Rupa Health Magazine. There, we have in-depth articles about almost any health condition you can imagine. 
And we give you step-by-step protocols that other clinicians have used to help their clients heal and that are verified by evidence-based sources. You should totally check it out and it'll transform your practice. And we can't wait to see you. So make sure you sign up today at rupahealth.com.